Hi, I'm Father Jim Martin. Welcome to Faith in Focus. We're so excited that you're here. This show is all about faith, what faith means to you, and how you live your faith every day. In this month's episode, America's senior editor, J.D. Long Garcia, will share his stories from reporting on the U.S. southern border. Then we'll talk with John Dickerson, host of CBS This Morning, about his faith and the way he likes to pray. In our People of God segment, we'll hear from Barbara, a spiritual director who began her ministry somewhat late in life. Then we'll look at some of the places you find God in places to pray. Thanks again for joining us. We hope you enjoy this episode of Faith in Focus. Today in our news segment, we're talking with J.D. Long Garcia, a senior editor covering Latinos and immigration for America Media. J.D. has just returned from Texas, where he interviewed people who live along the border in both the U.S. and Mexico. Welcome to Faith and Focus, J.D. Thanks for having me. J.D., when you were at the border, you met a number of people who really put a human face to our national debates about immigration. Could you tell us about some of the people you met? Absolutely. Well, we met a number of people who are doing humanitarian work and all at Catholic charities and at a migrant shelter. But we also met people who are seeking asylum in the United States. I was particularly taken by the story of one man whose son was killed by a gang in El Salvador. His son was 15 at the time he was killed. The man explained to me how he spent years looking for his son's body, but to no avail. He also told me how his daughter was raped by a police officer in El Salvador. And he told me the story there in the shelter in Nuevo Laredo. He gestures to his daughter, who was also there. The same police officer would lend his uniform to gang members who would wear them while committing crimes. The man asked us not to identify him in our story, and it'll be obvious why. He said he reported to the police officer to the proper authorities, and he said he had proof of his crimes. But he was told by his lawyer to leave the country immediately because he could not protect him. This man and his family then moved to Mexico, and they were there for a time. But then the gang found him there, and they threatened to kill him. He left that same day and headed to the U.S.-Mexico border. I think it's easy for us in our immigration debate to be for it to become a conversation about numbers and security concerns. But these problems can't be solved unless we understand the reasons why so many people are displaced and we begin to try to address those root problems. That's right. I mean, thanks for sharing that story with us. You know, it reminds me that when Jesus met people who are not part of his circle or not part of the Jewish people, like the Samaritan woman, the woman at the well, he doesn't dismiss her. He shows that he understands who she is and what has happened in her life. As Pope Francis says, he encounters her. Yeah, I think that's a good model for us as Christians to follow when we're trying to understand immigration. Obviously, we can't get to know each individual person, but I think if we try to get to know the difficulties that these different groups of people are facing, our policy decisions would be a lot better, more informed and more humane. In the end, a border wall or more border security aren't going to address the real suffering of our brothers and sisters in Central America. Well, J.D., thank you so much for going there, and thanks for sharing your insights and that story with us. You can find more of J.D.'s reporting from the border here on our YouTube channel. Up next, we'll introduce you to this month's guest, John Dickerson. Thank you for joining us for Faith and Focus. You can help us continue to have these important and open conversations about how faith touches our everyday lives at americamag.org slash donate. My name is Kara Cordy, and I currently am John's associate producer here at CBS This Morning. Welcome to CBS This Morning, Floridians. Are John is clearly someone who goes home and thinks about things that happened in that day and how he speaks to someone or how he acts towards someone, how he carries himself. 
I've never seen him treat anyone with anything less than respect and positivity and graciousness. And I think anyone who has had the privilege of working with him or really interacted with him in any way would be struck by how great of a person he is. To me, that is a manifestation of his faith practice. Doctor, you said becoming a mother clarified your values. So many people I've talked to who want to restrict abortion rights said parenthood clarified their values, and that's why... Well, I think uh, John's spirituality and faith manifests itself in two different ways. One is a very obvious way, where you hear John saying, you know, I went to... What did you do this weekend? I went to Mass. We had went to this great Mass. Things like that. I remember when John moderated two different debates during the 2016 primary. One of the things he kept in his pocket was his mother's rosary. So there are those kinds of obvious things where he kind of acts out his faith. And then I think there's John just as a person, which is a extremely compassionate, generous, very authentic person. And that's something that makes him different. Like many of you, I spent some time this week in January of 2009. I took the 10 year challenge. I posted a picture from 10 years ago and one from more recently. It's not really a challenge to post pictures of yourself on social media. You don't need grappling hooks. It's not that hard to climb Mount Vanity. Clearly this industry shares some portion on the Venn diagram of show business, for better or for worse. There are lights and cameras and famous people and important people. So when you are operating and working in a world that revolves around important people, of course, people get wrapped up in more vain aspects of life. John is someone who the vanity of it, the selfishness of it, falls so far down below any of his priorities. And I think that makes him stand out in this industry, and I think it makes him stand out walking down the street. You have done a, an exhaustive investigation in, into the presidency. So this spring, I'm going to be moving on. I'm going to be a campaign reporter, what they call an embed for the 2020 presidential campaign. I'm pretty, I'm pretty emotional about leaving John because it's an amazing education to watch him work every single day. I hope I have gathered as much as I can through osmosis, through experience. And I know that he has made me a kinder, more patient, more accepting person. And that's something that I'm not eager to walk away from. This month, I'm glad to welcome one of the hosts of CBS This Morning, John Dickerson. John is a celebrated journalist, author, and former moderator of Face the Nation. In his interviews, he listens carefully and treats people with respect while still asking the hard questions. Welcome to Faith and Focus, John. Thank you. It's great to be here. Yeah, thank you. I want to talk about your, your interviews. Uh, in your interviewing, you try to find common ground with the person you're interviewing, even though you disagree. Um, what has that taught you about connecting across political lines in 2018? Well, if we're ever going to get across political lines, we have to not judge people's motives instantaneously, not assume where they're coming from or anything like that. So if you have kind of... A, a humble um, approach towards them, you can do two things. You don't put them in a box, which means for anybody who's listening, you're really trying to get their actual answer. And you don't put them on the defensive by saying, this is what I expect from you or whatever. Now, the downside in the public sphere is that if you approach an interview that way and you don't have enough time, people will think, what are you, naive? Come on, he's a politician or he's a person who's got an interest in the thing you're asking. So when you ask the question in an open-ended way, you're doing a disservice to your listeners or viewers because you're suggesting that he's on the level. This is one of the criticisms you get. So it's very difficult. Having started in print, it was much easier because you could kind of get through that. You could do the introductory stuff. And then if you found out, look, they're not being straightforward with you, then you can participate in that way. But um, my hope is to always approach everything with the most generous interpretation and then be proved wrong but hopefully be proved right. <laughs> what do you do if you're in a situation where you feel like someone is definitely lying? Do you ever have to kind of check your own emotions and kind of the anger you might feel? Yes, and this is, this is the hardest thing, and this is new. When I started in the early 90s, there were guardrails. People felt that they couldn't say something out loud that was provably untrue, that that would be embarrassing. It would be like saying, you know, having a, a deep opinion about a book you'd never read. 
if somebody said, well, have you read it? And you said, no, you'd feel embarrassed. This is no longer the case in politics. So the problem is a lot of times it happens around things that are a little bit complicated. And if it's in a television interview, you have to, um, you don't want the, the lie to go unaddressed, but you have to do it in a way so that your viewers who don't know that they're lying understand why it is that you're saying they're not telling you the truth. And you've got to make sure because we live in such polarized uh, society right now that when you do it, the people who are on that person's side don't think you're doing it just because you are already ideologically on the other side. And again, that's why really you should start all interviews assuming that everybody's acting in good faith. Also, by the way, I mean, that's what Jesus tells us to do. <laughs> that's right. So that's not that that for me also is the way. Um, I try to approach people even if they're not on camera or not sitting for a formal interview. It's also very Jesuit practice, Ignatius said, always give people the benefit of the doubt. Um, speaking of Jesus, since you brought uh, that guy up, uh, your mother was also a celebrated journalist, Nancy Dickerson. Uh, and so journalism has really been part of your life and so has spirituality. Has your journalism uh, career deepened your spiritual life or changed it in any way? It's so uh, for me, um, I guess it's done it in a couple of ways. I just had the opportunity to um, f fortunately be in Charlottesville talking to some residents in public housing who, who were talking about some new public housing that's being built in Charlottesville. And it was great for me because it's the kind of interview I don't get to do very much anymore, which is talk to real people at length in a more easy atmosphere. And what you learn or are reminded of is the is our common humanity, which gets squeezed out in the political conversation and particularly on social media. So that's been wonderful. And there, and then in the other thing is being a journalist now and particularly one in the kind of public realm, um, it is the best check on your humility um, because, you know, a lot of times on Twitter and social media, you get attacked. And if you search what the nature of your strong reaction is to those unfair attacks, often pride is there and, you know, you're... Um, and while the attacks are obviously without merit in every case, um, you, um, I'm kidding, of course, um, my really strong reaction to them is usually a check to remind me that, you mm. know, I, I need to, even if, the, even if what they're saying is wrong, I need to kind of rejigger where I am in terms of how, you know, proud I am about, about what it is that I do. So kind of a check of something that, that grounds you and keeps you humble. How, how does that happen? What, how would you explain uh, how that works in your life? It's a very intimate space for me in terms of a, a, just a kind of true, here I am, this is, mm. all the artifice has gone away. Here's, here are my uh, problems. Here are the things I'm grateful for. Here are the people I'm praying for. Here's the parts of our world that I would like to pray for. Um, it's just, it's very, it's as close to whoever I am mm as I am, and I'm also trying to figure out who that person is. And so that sometimes happens in church. More often it happens in prayer. Um, I, I think also um, when I'm there with my family, uh, it's a way for me to communicate to the kids without um, sitting them down and explaining that this is something that's important to me. Sure, just and, by being there. Yeah, yeah. Now, that's interesting. You talked about uh, bringing what sounds like your what Thomas Mert would call your true self to Mass, but also... Yeah feeling God inviting you to become more of your true self. Yeah. Uh, is, there, is there a time during Mass when that happens? Or is it, I mean, are you praying throughout the Mass in, in that way? Are there moments when you uh, experience that more powerfully, would you say? Um, or is it one kind of continual prayer? It is one, it's one continual prayer. I am most intentional about it, actually, when I'm and often reading New Seeds of Contemplation um, hmm. uh, or any of his other mm -hmm. um, uh, works or anything else that I'm reading. Um, I used to, before I had this morning job, I used to have an actual uh, regimen that I quite liked, which was that I'd usually read a chapter of New Seeds and mm. then I'd write afterwards. And You'd write uh, uh, about your own spiritual life? Yes. Yeah. I, I'd write in my journal or I'd write in the margins. Um, and it was this very, um, in the morning, I can thoughts come more clearly to me than they do later in the day. And so it was this very special time for me with um, thinking through the and being more meditative about ideas. And so that's more intentional than at, at church. Sometimes at church, I'm just, uh, well, one, I'm just trying to show up. Mm -hmm. Then a lot of times I'm just being, trying to be, uh, I'm, I feel a, a really overwhelming sense of gratitude. Um, mm -hmm. 
and surprised by things in mass mm -hmm. than than with a with an intent that an intention or a discovery process in mass mass. But that's what I love about it because a lot of times it'll I'll ideas or thoughts or mm. will come to me in the middle of Beautiful. either the homily or while I'm praying uh, um, or while I'm just looking over at my daughter who's doing her homework. Let's in, during mass. Yes, <laughs> it's good to be good to be practical during mass. I can only <laughs> ask so much, I, I Father. <laughs> Um, let's talk about that morning prayer. That's really interesting. Uh, you you would read New Seeds by Thomas Merton, mm -hmm. and then would you take time to to sort of pray quietly with mm -hmm. it? Usually, what is I'll read, and he will talk either about um, humility or the search for God, or knowing yourself, or the various different ways we can fool ourselves about um, our spirituality, and also about our self righteousness. Any of his various. Um, Lessons, which is fun to try to read between the lines with him too, because sometimes you think he's talking to himself. Um, <laughs> I think most times he's talking to himself, yeah. especially when he's talking about ego. <laughs> right, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Well, like all of us, he struggled. Yeah. yeah. Um, so uh, usually there will be just be something that hits me, and it's funny if it hasn't. Um, and again, it's not just with Merton, but it, he was always the thing I would. Um, um, uh, it sometimes happens with things that you've written, um, and. Um, and I, just whenever whatever it is hits me, that then becomes the thing that um, I either pray directly about that. I either, you know, say in our father and and then just kind of an addendum of conversation afterwards or I write about it um, because for me, writing is the way I understand anything mm -hmm. or, or, or sure. wrestle with things. And then I'm, I kind of try and fix it on the page and mm -hmm. think that's what I believe. And, and recently, I've really been interested in this idea of um, the learning that happens in it's not exactly prayer when I'm writing in a journal, but maybe it's, it's prayer. Okay. Yeah, Good. sure. All right. I'm going to call it that for now. It is, sure. Um, but I, I, I feel like I make discoveries while I'm doing that. And so, um, and I do that now, but it just happens in weirder times. I mean, it's not every morning. It's kind of now as I can or, um, but that quiet of the morning. In fact, I'm about to go on vacation and that's one of the things I'm really looking forward to is being able to recapture that mm. that period in the morning. Uh, what do you have an image of God that you like, or is there? Yeah, I was talking about this with my wife, who was. Uh, um, he, no, I mean it's it's Jesus. Jesus, okay. But it's also, but it's not a. You know, it's not the it's the face of Jesus doesn't come before me as I think, and so sometimes I think. So I don't. I don't think I really. Um, Funny though, because when I think about um, how I want to be, how I want to behave, the instruction manual, it's very clearly coming from Jesus. It's, it's Jesus. A, it's a. It's almost. Then it's Jesus in a uh, as a friend, as a mm. as a okay. as a person I want to be like. Okay, so a model, kind yeah. of an example. Right. Yeah. What have your kids taught you about uh, the faith, raising kids? Having to explain it to them. There's nothing mm. more. Um, I was going to say humbling. That's not right. I mean, humbling because I don't have the perfect words, but that's not what I feel exactly. When I'm trying to describe, um, first of all, I'm glad they're asking because uh, they want, it means they want to know. Yeah, that, that comes from God. Yeah. That curiosity. Yeah. Um, and it taught me, well, it's forced me to be, to answer the question about what it does in my life. And for what, yourself, too. For so. myself, that's mm -hmm. what I mean, yeah. And which is wonderful. That's basically what kids have done for me in a whole host of things. Why do you believe mm. what you believe? Why do you treat people the way you do? Why do you, um, um, why should a person uh, do the right thing when nobody's watching? Um, and which comes into politics a lot. <laughs> that's right, um, all the time. And I've tried to come at them in various different ways because, and at one point saying like, even if you decided not to be religious, turns out, this is a great way to live your life, even if you're even you don't have to sign up for the whole Catholicism thing. You mean gratefully? Yeah, gratefully, <clears throat> humbly, caring about other people. Like, turns out that's you know just read the Beatitudes, mm -hmm. kids, and mm -hmm. then we'll and then we'll talk. Um, and I think also uh, we talked about being a model earlier. Um, it gives me, um, you know, it, it it orders my life. It helps me a lot, and so to the extent that 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 they see that um and i want to show them that mm -hmm. because it because i want to give that to them mm -hmm. um it was a gift that my parents that my mother in particular i mean my 
father was a part of it too, but Catholicism was such a part. It's an incredible gift that she gave me um, through God. But um, so I want to give them that same gift. You talked about how your work influences your spirituality. How about uh, vice versa? Do you do you find that you bring your spirituality into your work? Um, I think well on the so all journalists should be humble because we are so often wrong and and that people mistake what I mean by that. Um, Einstein had a really good record of being right about a lot of things. He was really wrong about mm -hmm. huge chunks, of, and I'm no Einstein, but the point was in scientific um, inquiry, you have a theory, you test it, you test it, you test it, and when you're proved wrong, it's not, oh, you idiot, it's, oh, that's wrong, now we go over here. Mm -hmm. we, we build our understanding based on a sense of humility because you want to be as humble as possible because then you don't think that um, you don't miss the time that you're you have a chance to discover something new. So that's the secular way to think about it. From a from a Christian standpoint, humility is for me, as Merton says, it's our bread and butter. It's um, it's important for me because of the way you treat other people. Um, it's important for me because uh, because pride is one of the worst, I mean, if not the worst. Um, it is the worst. It's the worst. It's the worst. So you want to stay away from that. And so in terms of journalism, both in the way you treat people, but also the way you just um, look at things to be humble in, and make sure you're um, not bringing your you know, hot take to something, mm -hmm. that, you're, mm -hmm. that you're evaluating things uh, on the merits and in the moment. And um, I, I have disordered affections for sure in the personal realm and in the biz and in the news realm, I cover a lot of campaign politics and the chase and the the drama of American politics and the what's happening and um, and that's really important. But it is over. We need to recalibrate the kinds of stuff we cover and the way we cover it, because there are big long term problems that are affecting lots and lots of people that don't get the kind of coverage they need to and don't get addressed in the public sphere the way they need to, and. Um, my faith pulls me to try to be better at that, and uh, we got a lot of work to do. Well, I'm glad to hear that. So, John, thank you for joining us. Thank you, Jim. I could stay here till breakfast. Thank me you. too. <laughs> Up next, we'll hear from Barbara, a spiritual director who found her calling late in life. Stay with us, please. Today on People of God, we're talking with my friend Barbara Lee. Barbara is a spiritual director here in New York City. Welcome to Faith and Focus, Barbara. Thank you for inviting me, Father Jim. So, Barbara, you had a, a distinguished career as a lawyer and a judge. How did you end up as a spiritual director? Well, when I retired, I was very happy volunteering as an English teacher at an immigrant services agency. And I started to hear the Holy Spirit whispering that I should become a spiritual director. So I spent three summers at Creighton University, which is a Jesuit university in Omaha, Nebraska, with a world-famous training program for spiritual directors. And in the course of both my studies and my practice since then, I gradually came to realize that I was called to minister to people in my own age group because that's why the call was so late. I couldn't have ministered to the aging until I was old enough to share their experiences. So now I do one-on-one -on -one direction. Not all of my directees are in the target age group. I have some younger people and that's wonderful. I give retreats to retired people and people who live in assisted living facilities. And I'm just aware of the presence of the Holy Spirit throughout the whole process. Well, that's great. Another new role you have uh, to conclude uh, is as a newly published author. Uh, can you tell oh, yes. us a little bit about your wonderful new book? The book is called God Isn't Finished With Me Yet. And it's a discussion of how Ignatian spirituality can apply and can be helpful to people who are undergoing experiences such as retirement, preparing for retirement, 
widows and widowers, people who have experienced various kinds of losses. And the title is really a summary of my own spiritual journey. God isn't finished with me yet. <laughs> Well, that's wonderful. Uh, Barbara Lee, retired lawyer and judge and current spiritual director and author, thank you so much for joining us on People of God. Thank you, Father Jim. You can find Barbara's wonderful new book, God Isn't Finished With Me Yet, everywhere books are sold. And if you have a story of how God touched your life, tell us about it at americamag.org slash faithshow. St. Ignatius says we should find God in all things. So in this month's Places to Pray, we're going to look at some of the beautiful places where you find God's presence. Our first place to pray comes from Vivian, who saw this beautiful mosaic of the visitation in downtown New York. Like Vivian, many of us like to pray with images of the saints. Icons and paintings like these help us to imagine the saints and reflect on what they might have to tell us today, and also reminds us that we too can be saints in our lives. Thanks for your photo, Vivian. Our next two posts show us that you can find time for God both at work and at home. Frances sent us this beautiful photo where she likes to pray in her house. And Harry shared this photo of his desk where he set up a little display, a kind of altar. Whether you're at work or at home, it's important to take a break and spend a quiet moment with God. Christine sent us this beautiful photo of an interfaith chapel, which she visited recently. Sometimes places from outside our own religious traditions can evoke an awe and curiosity that can lead to some surprising moments in prayer. Thanks to everyone who shared their favorite places to pray with us. You can send us your Instagram posts at americamag.org slash faithshow. I hope you enjoyed this episode of Faith and Focus. To learn more about the show or to support Faith and Focus and share your faith story, visit americamag.org slash faithshow. We'll have a new episode next month with the feminist theologian Elizabeth Johnson. See you there. Thank you for watching Faith and Focus. You can find more videos like this on our YouTube channel and subscribe so you never miss an episode. To learn more about how you can have your story featured on the show, visit americamag.org slash faithshow.